you guys enjoying this wonderful weather? <laughs> yeah, I'm loving this. Yeah. Um, I saw somebody walking down the street earlier, though, but they were on the left, like in a parka and everything. I looked at my watch, and it was 60 degrees. <laughs> well, we're in Florida. Yeah. So thank you so much for coming out. And, you know, Alyssa did such a wonderful job with the speech therapy talk. I just really enjoyed that. She was I tried to talk to Barry too, and she, she had me doing all this stuff. And, um, Barry, that's, I don't talk like that. Um, so, this morning we're going to talk about Parkinsonism. So, this is a, uh, a topic that's kind of hard to talk about because there's a lot of technical details. But on the other hand, it's important because a lot of people have Parkinsonism and they don't have a real diagnosis or whether or not they have Parkinson's disease. So, uh, we're going to dive into this. Like I said, there's at least some technical details we're going to talk about. Uh, and then there might be a little Q&A afterwards as well. So this is Bill. Um, looks kind of like Mr. Magoo. So Bill uh, has fallen down and he goes to the emergency room. And this is something that we see a lot in the emergency room. Um, he's 78 years old, he falls down and hits his head. And as you know, head injuries are very dangerous. Um, they can cause bleeding in the head as well as brain injuries. Um, and so it turns out his wife says that he's been having a lot more problems walking balance is not so good, memory is not so good, and he also hallucinates in his sleep, he yells out in the middle of the night. So he, sometimes he throws himself out of bed, and that's sometimes how he winds up hitting his head. Um, he has been losing weight, and he, when you ask him why, he says he can't really taste food anymore. He does say that his hands shake. So he went to a neurologist, and they told him that he had Parkinson's disease, and they put him on carbon and believe it or cinnamon. And as you guys know, that's the main drug that we use. That's been out for 60 years. It's kind of like aspirin. It's still the best drug that we have. Um, we have 23 medications or preparations for Parkinson's right now. But the carbon and believe it up is kind of the go-to for, for uh, the first drug. Um, and it didn't really do much for him. So Bill didn't get a response to that. And then he went to another neurologist and he said, there's no way you've got Parkinson's. He took him off the carbon and believe it up. He didn't do any worse. He didn't do any better on the medications, no worse coming out of it. But when you look at Bill, you know, it clearly looks like he has Parkinson's disease. He's got decreased facial expression and blinking. He's got these tremors. But the tremors, instead of being at rest, are all the time. No matter what he does, he's got his hands by his side, or he's walking or he's talking. He's doing activities for me in the office. He still has tremors. Um, he did get a cat scan, and his wife read, read it to me. And just, says possible NPH and very ventricular microvascular ischemic changes. And she's kind of scratching her head and she's like, what is that? So uh, what is Bill's diagnosis? And the short answer is, I don't know, because Bill has a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And we'll talk about that. So Parkinsonism is a descriptive term that can include a lot of different things. Um, it can include tremor and rational with action. People tend to get stiffness in their arms and legs, uh, called rigidity. They move slowly, which is what we call bradykinesia. So bradykinesia is a very common term with Parkinson's. Uh, when we're talking about that. And that can be slowness with walking, talking. A lot of times I'll hear from spouses that, um, you know, they go for walks around their neighborhood, and the person with, with Parkinsonism has difficulty keeping up, and they're falling farther and farther behind. They may wobble around uh, and have difficulty maintaining their balance, just standing up. Um, a lot of times people will also trip and fall down. And I mentioned the, the mask face or what we call poker face. Sometimes people pass out because their blood pressure drops. And that's called orthostatic hypotension. Uh, sometimes their heart doesn't respond properly when they get up, and that's one of the reasons they pass out. They have a slow heart rate called bradycardia. Falling happens frequently, and that can be either due to shuffling, not picking up your feet, or uh, some people have this thing called retropulsion, where they get up out of a chair and they fall backwards into the chair again, or they can just completely fall over. Some people have dementia, you know, personality changes, they, they were nice and now they're angry and irritable. Uh, they may have delusions. Uh, so I have one patient who came in and was 92 or so and thought that his wife, 91 years old, was leaving the house and having an affair on him. Here in the way of thinking people are stealing from you. Uh, some people will hallucinate, and hallucinations are not while you're asleep. Hallucinations happen while you're awake. 
If you're, they happen when you're asleep, it's vivid dreams we call REM behavioral disorder. Some people can't hold in their urine or their stool. Um, erectile dysfunction is very common. So is uh, a lack of ability to sweat. People get double vision and eye movement problems. Some people can't speak. They can't come up with words in the middle of a sentence. You know, they're trying to tell a story, and the story stops because they can't think of the word. And they get embarrassed, and they'll stop interacting with people because of that. Um, lack of sense of smell happens in about 90% of people with Parkinson's or Parkinsonism. Uh, and constipation is very, very common, and it's also made worse by the medications. So this Parkinsonism term is very confusing to patients. You know, what is it exactly that I have? A lot of people want to be put into this little box. What exactly is my diagnosis? And it's, it's very frustrating. They say, well, you've got Parkinsonism, you know, uh, and they go off and they look at Parkinsonism, they don't understand it, and then their kids will call up and, you know, would you please explain Parkinsonism to me? And, um, uh, doctors themselves, uh, other neurologists, as well as uh, do doctors out in the community, if it, they hear the Parkinsonism diagnosis, they assume it's Parkinson's disease and they kind of go down that road and it's really not. Um, insurance companies uh, can often get in trouble like putting people into nursing homes and things like that because if you tell someone they have Parkinsonism, they might not cover it. Um, with pharmacies, you know, some of the drugs, nowadays you have to go through a legal process just to get some of these newer drugs. And even if these drugs are better than the carbonate, but even if, uh, sometimes you have to jump through these hoops to try to get these things covered. They're very expensive. But if the pharmacy hears you have Parkinsonism and it's not Parkinson's disease, then sometimes it won't pay for the medication. Physical therapists, occupational therapists, and speech therapists all have also um, have a little bit of difficulty dealing with this because not only do they have to explain it to their patients, but it's hard to know how to treat it. So this is a, uh, unfortunately, a very blurry slide. It looks really great on my computer. But uh, basically, there's a lot of things that are not Parkinson's disease, um, like the yellow line and the blue line, <laughs> the orange line. Um, so each of these describes different um, uh, conditions. I'm sorry it turned out this way. On my computer, it was very crisp. Uh, so the correct diagnosis is often hard to make. Uh, it affects our treatment decisions, uh, where we send people for rehab, whether or not they can have any brain surgery, like deep brain stimulation. Uh, it affects prognosis. So if you have a diagnosis of one thing, like Lewy body or PSP versus Parkinson's, that's a different prognosis. And, uh, and people need to know that. They need to know, you know where am I heading and what's going to happen in the future. Uh, so it helps with planning to know the diagnosis. Sometimes it also helps to talk to people you know, who are worried about their family members, their kids, you know, getting the same sort of disease. So how good are we at diagnosing Parkinson's? Um, we're okay. We're not great. I will say that um, this is a study that was done a while back looking at 400 patients or so who were told they had Parkinson's disease. So of those 400 patients, it turns out that 75% of them, 74% had Parkinsonism, the other 26% did not. And they had something else like a tremor, problems with walking, or dementia. And then of those 299 patients of the 402 that did have Parkinsonism, 213 of them had problems with Parkinson's, and the other 86 had something that's possible. You know, it's Parkinsonism, and that's all they could say. So we're not great at diagnosing. There are some things that we can look at that are risk factors. Um, it's not on this slide, but one of those is lack of sense of smell. Uh, another one is constipation, and another is that REM sleep disorder. If you have all three of those and you have a tremor, your, your likelihood of having Parkinson's is about 70%. So you can see it's in, from a former slide I showed you, 75% of those people went to a neurologist and were told they had Parkinson's. Well, you can just ask those four questions and you can kind of almost come up with the same sort of diagnosis. Um, so this is another study that was done looking at uh, 131 patients who were told they had Parkinson's who saw a movement disorder specialist. And 90% of them actually did wind up being diagnosed with Parkinson's or Parkinsonism. But then another 10% of them were not. So. Even, even in the best of hands, at the best of times, um, it's hard to diagnose Parkinson's versus Parkinsonism. So if you've been to my talk before, you've seen this slide. This is Michael J. Fox, and he's uh, exhibiting a couple of things where we usually see with Parkinson's. And one of those is that masked face. So uh, I've had patients come in and have this 
no expression on their face and just crack the best jokes, you know, because you don't see what's underneath the surface. And it's easy to think that they're upset or angry or ap apathetic, but they're not. You know? um, and he also has this tenting of the hands. So his hands are like that for a reason, because when you get Parkinson's, a lot of times your hand will curl up. It's called tenting. Uh, voice becomes soft. Posture usually is stooped forward. People tend to fall. They can have problems with their eye movements. Um, and the handwriting is very small, as people are going along. It's called uh, progressive micrographia. It starts out nice and tall, like this M here, and by the time it gets down, it's just saying my leg is feeling better, whatever it says there. It starts to get very, very small. It's called progressive micrographia. Sometimes uh, there's things we can't see that are beneath the surface, and a lot of times those things are actually more debilitating than having Parkinson's disease. And uh, that includes psychiatric problems. Um, Depression and apathy happen in about 30 to 50 percent of people with Parkinson's. Interestingly, that depression um, and anxiety you know, happens in about 30 to 50 percent of caretakers of people with Parkinson's. Cognitive impairment or dementia symptoms are very common. Memory loss is not really too much of a component with Parkinson's uh, or Parkinsonism. Uh, hallucinations are at times. The REM sleep disorder is very common. Something like 80 to 90 percent of people with Parkinson's will fall out of bed or, or throw themselves out of bed or crash, kick, yell, talk in their sleep. And as I mentioned, 90 percent of them have lack of sense of smell. A lot of people with Parkinson's will also get problems with their gastrointestinal system. The constipation is is that um, everybody's going to have some of that. There's also something called gastroparesis, where your stomach gets filled up too quickly. So instead of eating a full sandwich, now you're only able to eat a half a sandwich. And uh, you get filled up, you feel full. And the result of that is you feel full, but then you eventually start losing weight. And that's a problem with Parkinson's. Uh, a lot of people have significant drooling uh, that we can treat with different methods. Uh, excessive sweating and erectile dysfunction. And I mentioned this uh, low blood pressure called orthostatic hypotension. That's a Parkinson's issue. Uh, this is something we teach our students. Parkinson's is a trap. It's tremor, rigidity, akinesia, which means a lack of movement, or bradykinesia, and then the postural instability. So Parkinson's is a trap. Uh, about one and a half percent of the population gets diagnosed with Parkinson's disease around age 62. So as you can imagine, the demographics here in this area, Sarasota, Bradenton, uh, area uh, all the way from you know, we see people from Fort Myers up to St. Peter over the Sebring at, at Neuro Challenge Foundation. That's a huge catchment area. We estimate there's probably 5,000 people in that area with Parkinson's disease because of the age demographics. Um, there's probably around 2 million Americans in general that have Parkinson's disease. So, how do we diagnose it? Well, one is by doing the history and the exam, as we just talked about the different things that you can see. There's also a scan called DAT scan that we use sometimes. We don't use it for every single patient, but if the diagnosis is unclear, it can actually be uh, a really helpful tool. Here's a picture of the DAT scan. Has anybody had the DAT scan here? Probably a few of you, yeah. So uh, in this upper left panel, you see that's a, a normal DAT scan in that gold area, or goldish red area. That's dopamine producing term nerve terminals. And then these three different uh, other panels are patients with Parkinson's. And you can see that that, that bright area becomes reduced uh, sequentially. Now, another thing that's often confused with Parkinson's uh, is benign tremor. So this tends to run in families about 50% of the time. It usually happens when people are doing things like holding their hands up or when they're trying to hold a glass, uh, eat in a restaurant, their peas are flying all over the place. One of the things we teach our students is that uh, a patient comes in and they say that every night they have a glass of wine because it stops their tremors. They have benign tremors. That's, that's not Parkinson's. That's a really easy kind of diagnostic tool. I, I tell people that's not a license to drink a lot. It's just, you know. <laughs> um, and they don't have a resting tremor, whereas people with Parkinson's have this resting, rotating tremor in one hand or sometimes both hands. Uh, these people with benign tremor get this tremor when they're doing things. And that happens up to 4% of the population, either in young people or in older people. Why do people get that? We don't really know. There's different parts of the brain here um, that you can look at. This can be a test later. I want you to be able to regurgitate those names. Uh, 
the inferior olivary nucleus is associated with increased glutamate. Okay. Um, but the point is that um, we really don't know why people get benign tremors. However, if you have benign tremors, there's actually an increased risk of converting into Parkinson's later on. The medications we use for benign tremors are very different than we use for Parkinson's. Uh, there's a blood pressure pill, there's some anti-seizure medications, there's uh, some sedatives, and there's also deep brain stimulation surgery, which works very well for that. Sometimes we'll inject Botox into the forearm, or um, there's a new uh, procedure called uh, focused ultrasound ablation. Have you guys heard of that? So it's, it's a, basically it's a helmet with um, little portals on it that you can uh, uh, put someone in a high frequency uh, sound field, and it's ultrasound. You can actually burn part of the brain. And uh, they're doing that in about three or four places in Florida now. It's FDA approved for essential tremor and also for Parkinson's, but um, it's not quite clear where it's going to fit in in terms of uh, Parkinson's right now. So, this is a picture of an uh, Archimedes spiral for a patient with an essential tremor on the left and Parkinson's on the right. I use this in my office uh, every day. I, I draw a spiral and have someone else try to complete the spiral or, or make a copy of it. And, and if somebody makes this little tight spiral, then it looks like that's probably Parkinson's. There's some writing. Again, in the left, that's someone with a central tremor. On the right is the patient who has that progressive micrographia with Parkinson's. Um, the central tremor itself, just like Parkinson's, is often misdiagnosed. Uh, this is another study that was looking at people who were told they had a central tremor, and maybe 37% of them didn't. They had something else. Of 26 patients, they actually had Parkinson's disease. So we see patients also have this thing that we call mixed tremor. So they look like Parkinson's, they have Parkinson's uh, face, they shuffle their gait, and they have tremors in both hands at all times. And uh, we put them on Parkinson's medications, they don't get any better. We put them on essential tremor medications, they don't get any better. So we call that mixed tremor. Um, that's hard to treat uh, and can often be very frustrating for patients as well. Most of those patients, or some, excuse me, some of those patients will eventually transform into true diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Okay, so dementia with Lewy bodies. You guys have heard of that one, I'm sure. That's a disease where people tend to get hallucinations really early on in the disease process. Uh, my dad had this, and he developed it about five, six years ago. So he was already in his late 80s when he got it. Um, and um, he started calling me up and he said, hey, I'm seeing people like in Harlequin dress and sitting on the couch with little kids and I go over there and they kind of disappear, you know. And my dad had been shuffling for a couple of years and he had neuropathy and then I immediately I put two and two together and oh, he's got the body. And he did and it, you know, did progress. Um, so those patients look like Parkinson's but at the same time, within a very short amount of time, they develop these hallucinations. And the diagnosis for it is it can be um, made generally with the hallucination issue, but also we can do other tests like a fat scan. Sometimes when we use medications for the hallucinations, they make people get worse. And that's also a tip off that's probably moving by. We use Parkinson's medications for them, but we also use some Alzheimer's medications. There's one called Denepazil or Aricept that we, is uh, sometimes helpful. Um, so, kind of backing up again, if it's Parkinson's versus Lewy body, the way we know is the hallucinations are much more common in Lewy body and very early on in the process. People with Parkinson's can get hallucinations, but it's usually 5, 10, 15 years down the road. If it's right around the same time, in fact, it was in one year of the Parkinson's symptoms, then it's Lewy body. The tremor looks very similar. There, people respond to levodopa like people with Parkinson's uh, do, but they can get worse. Their hallucinations will increase. And as I mentioned, there's medications that we can use. There's a much more rare disease. It's called progressive supranuclear palsy. Another thing is to be on the test later. Um, so this is an eye movement problem where people can't look up or down. Their eye movements get restricted. And as a result, they have problems with their balance and their posture. The thing that you don't, one of the things we don't think about when you're walking around normally is you're moving your head and it's bobbing up and down, and your brain is controlling your eyes. So if you if you go home and you look in the mirror and you do this with your you know, right at your own eyeballs, so you look in the mirror and you move your head around, you'll see that your eyes don't really move until you move your head far enough that they start to move. Because your brain is correcting for your head posture and your eyes are just to stay stuck there. Um, in people with PSP, that doesn't happen anymore. 
They move their head and their eyes go with their head. And they can't look up or down or sideways or backwards. And as a result, they tend to fall over. So here's a, um, a kind of a graphic showing on the left. So someone with PSD here has kind of, they have very wide eyes, they have an open mouth. They tend to fall backwards. So it's quite hard to read, but the person on the left has Parkinson's and the person on the right has PSP in each of these different panels. So people with Parkinson's tend to lean forward, people with PSP tend to lean, lean backwards, and they fall backwards, and it's very dangerous. It's, it's relatively rare, um, and, uh, but it is something that we see in, in NeuroChallenge Foundation. We see uh, all these different diagnoses, and, uh, and uh, we treat them as well. So. That's one of the things I tell these patients too. The Louis body, Parkinsonism, whatever it is, the Neurochallenge Foundation is there for you. We, we include all of those diagnoses. Um, and in some patients that have this, it's actually interesting. Here's a brain scan. On the left side is looking at the brain from the side. Uh, the brain stem here, there's a little spot in the back called the cerebellum. It's kind of that fluffy thing hanging off the back. Uh, that's too small. It's, it should be nice and thick. And then in part of this, brain stem here is actually uh, degenerated. It's called hummingbird sign, so we can see that on some of those patients. And then in the uh, handwriting, it's interesting that it's almost like a, a typewriter. When we see, when people have PSP, they have very small handwriting. It doesn't start out large. It starts out small and stays small. It's almost like a typewriter. It's really interesting. There's another rare disease called MSA, and that's a Parkinsonism diagnosis where people have mainly the orthostatic hypotension and other things that go along with that with your autonomic nervous system control of your body. So they tend to get erectile dysfunction very early on. Um, they sweat, uh, when they, when they lose the ability to sweat, and they have balance problems. But the main thing is the drop in the blood pressure that we see, and it causes people to, to pass out and fall over. Uh, again, it's a very rare disease, about 0.07% by age 68. We can get an MRI, and uh, I don't know if you see up towards the top here, there's a black dot, and below that black dot, there's like this little quadrants, these four quadrants. It's called the high cross bun sign that we can sometimes see in patients with this diagnosis, so it helps with that. Another very rare disease, but very interesting, is called cortical basal degeneration, and that causes lack of ability to use your hand. So, for instance, using uh, the microwave or using your phone or things like that, you lose the understanding of how to do that. It's not strength, it's not sensation, it's your, your brain no longer knows how to use those tools. Uh, and along with that, they tend to get a language problem and dementia symptoms. And interestingly, sometimes they have this thing called alien link phenomenon where their hand will do something that they don't want it to do, like unbutton your clothes or um, I shake, you shake someone's hand that has this, and they'll grip onto your hand and they can't let go. And they're like, okay, let go of my hand now. You can let go and they can't. Um, so again, it's a very rare condition. Um, and there's another one. This is uh, something that Bruce Willis has. Um, uh, primary progressive aphasia. You guys heard about that? The yeah. actor. So um, he, uh, over the last couple of years, um, has developed this PDA, and he can't really talk very well. He stumbles on his words, and he stops talking, and he's developed Parkinsonism, and he stops acting as a result of this. Um, so a very, again, a very rare problem. So this is another one that's very similar. It's called primary progressive apraxia of speech. Um, very rare. Um, now, what's well, something that's more common than any of these little rare diseases, and even Parkinson's, is called vascular Parkinsonism. This is, a, this is a very important one because this is very common. So um, people look like they have Parkinson's. They have a shuffling gait, they um, uh, slow movement. Uh, one of the things that they don't have is this resting tremor. Uh, so they have no tremor, and then both sides of their body are kind of the same, whereas in Parkinson's, they get, you know, people get more on one side than the other. With vascular Parkinson's, both sides look the same on exam. Uh, it's very common. Um, maybe up to 20% of people that have Parkinson's symptoms actually have vascular Parkinson's. And this one is actually a little easier to diagnose because we see it on the brain. So this is the brain of someone with vascular Parkinson's. And you see those white patchy areas in the front and in the back of the brain. Those are little tiny blood vessels that have given up. They've been picked off. And there's, there's thousands of them that have been picked off. 
you get one that gets picked off, you don't notice it, you lose a thousand brain cells. You know, we have billions of brain cells. That happens thousands of times and it starts to affect gait and balance and speed of thought. The other thing you see on this um, is what we call atrophy or shrinkage. The brain is shrunken on the outside as a result of that. There's another diagnosis that I mentioned earlier called normal pressure hydrocephalus. We teach our medical students, um, pardon me, but it's called wet, wacky, and wobbly. So they lose control of their bladder, uh, they get dementia symptoms, and then they tend to have balance issues. And uh, what we see is that the inside of the brain, it normally has a little bit of brain fluid, that brain fluid gets to be too much, and, uh, and that's something that is treatable to some extent in some of those patients by relieving the pressure with a little thing called a shunt. It's, uh, it's like um, putting a pen or a, a little tube inside the brain, and that relieves the pressure. So here's it on the left is somebody that has normal pressure hydrocephalus. They have too much fluid. They have about three times as much fluid as they should have on the inside of the brain. So the other thing I want to point out here is if you look at the outside of the brain, especially in the back, it's, it's squished up against the skull. If that's a normal brain, that looks good. Um, so they don't have that atrophy on the outside, whereas the brain on the uh, opposite panel, you can see that they have a normal amount of fluid, but the outside of the brain is atrophied or shrunken. So the one on the left here is, is too much pressure, and the one on the right is uh, from uh, atrophy or shrinkage. Uh, another thing that's also very common is sometimes as doctors and hospitals, we give people Parkinsonism by accident, and that is medications. Uh, medications that are most famous for that are these antipsychotic medications that people take for hallucinations and, and uh, psychosis. But more frequently nowadays, doctors are giving people drugs for depression. Uh, so a drug that has become kind of more popular for depression now is, is an antipsychotic. It's called Abilify, and there's a few of those. Um, and there's Risperidone, uh, Tiapine, Haldol. Any of these can make you look exactly like you have Parkinson's disease. And once you stop the drug, you get better, and it goes away. Um, so if, if, that, if you're taking one of those drugs and you're not sure what you have, it's sometimes a good idea to get off that drug. Maybe talk to your psychiatrist about it first, you know, of course, and your, and your doctor, just to make sure that that's going to be OK. But uh, we've seen people get better. Uh, Reglan is one of these drugs for um, for nausea that will cause people to look exactly like they have Parkinson's, and then we take it away and they, they get back to normal. Uh, sometimes uh, some of the other normal antidepressants, like well and and Cymbalta, can also cause tremors and looks like Parkinson's. There's a few other diseases that are also very rare. Uh, ALS, which is Lou disease, um, Huntington's disease, Wilson's, Kutzko-Yaka, or Mad Cow. Uh, they can cause people to look like they have Parkinson's. And then Alzheimer's, once it's progressed long enough, people tend to get Parkinsonism. Uh, there's also something called psychogenic Parkinsonism, where people are so depressed that they look like they have Parkinson's, and we treat them aggressively, and the Parkinson's go away. Um, other causes, uh, anxiety, drug withdrawal from alcohol, uh, weakness, nerve problems, uh, restless leg syndrome, low blood pressure, those things can all be kind of mistaken for uh, Parkinsonism. Shuffling uh, in the gait uh, due to damage to the brain or the spinal cord, often also mistaken for Parkinson's. Uh, and I mentioned neuropathy as well. So if you have Parkinsonism or symptoms, number one, see a neurologist. Okay. Number two, if you can, see a movement disorder specialist who, who that's all they see is they need to see people with Parkinsonism. Um, if you still are unclear, seek a second opinion. I tell people go to Cleveland Clinic, Emory, University of Florida, University of South Florida, whatever you need to do to see somebody to kind of get a better idea as to what it is that you have. You know, um, and I, I always encourage that. Um, if your doctor doesn't want you to get a second opinion, that's usually a red flag. Um, and then, so the other thing is, no matter what, you have to exercise every single day, no matter what your diagnosis is. So now it's time to play Dr. Sutherland Says. <laughs> My favorite game. Exercise is as important as any medication you can take for Parkinson's disease. Have you heard that before? Yeah. You've heard it from me, I'm sure you heard it from everybody else. This is the truth. You have to be active. Exercise is, is truly medicine. We've done studies where we've seen 
what happens inside the brain when you exercise. You make dopamine in your exercise, and you also make these growth factors that help your brain stay connected. Um, so we've also done studies to see what happens in people who have early dementia if they exercise. It reduces their dementia and progression by about 20%. Um, exercise also has been done in a head-to-head -head study with, a, with a, what do you say, antidepressant drugs, I think it was Zoloft. And it was twice as effective as Zoloft at helping with depression. Exercise is really good medicine. Another thing I like to say is being sedentary is like taking poison for Parkinson's. You cannot be sedentary. I know it goes along with exercise. You cannot be sedentary. It's, it's bad, bad news. Just try to stay active. Get up and move around. You know, don't let yourself sit in front of the TV for two hours. You know, um, get up and walk around a little bit. And then uh, finally, you know, when you get to see the physical therapist, occupational therapist, speech therapist, they give you these exercises to do at home. And most people think, yeah, I felt better and I did well. And then they go home and they don't follow up on it and they don't do it. And they lose that ground that they had just gained. You have to do those exercises at home that they taught you to do. It's very, very important. And then finally, uh, you know, we've been um, helping people with Neuro Challenge Foundation uh, for many, many years. These are a lot of my friends on these slides. <laughs> um, and it's been a, a real honor to, to be involved and to be able to help out in the community. And it is a community. Sarasota Royal Hospital has been uh, a wonderful partner for us the whole time, like from the very beginning. Uh, we have wonderful volunteers, staff, our new CEO. I'm, I'm very um, honored and lucky to be involved. So. Thank you guys for coming out today. We're going to do, I think, a question and answer session. Um, you guys